Welcome to the organic chemistry video content to accompany the Organic Chemistry 1 Lecture Guide and the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer. The problems in this video come from Part 2, Substitution, Elimination, and Oxidation. These problems are from Lesson 2.1, Tracking Stereocenters in Reactions. Consider a reaction that has the possibility of producing the S or the R isomer of 2-butanol. This question specifies that both of these products are formed at the same reaction rate. It asks us to use our ability to determine the relative stability of each isomer to make a prediction about which isomer or isomers would be the thermodynamically favored product. Well, we know that two enantiomers like these have the same stability as one another. So if we drew reaction coordinate diagrams to reflect the reactions as described in this problem, they would look like this, where the reactants would have the same energy. You would have the same energy of activation because the problem tells us that both products form at the same rate and the products R isomer or S isomer would both have the same stability as well because they are enantiomers of one another. We can therefore conclude that both products will be formed at the same rate as indicated in the problem. Each of these products forms with the same spontaneity or with the same thermodynamic favorability and we would therefore expect to get a 50% mixture of the R and S isomers. A 50% mixture of two enantiomers is known as a racemic mixture. Our second problem considers a reaction that has the possibility of producing the RR, SS, RS, or SR isomers of 2-bromo-3-methylpentane. We are first asked to draw Newman projections as a tool to figure out the relative stabilities of these isomers. From the names alone, we can make a few observations. First, the RR isomer and the SS isomer are enantiomers because they are mirror images of each other, the R becoming an S in its mirror image, and they're both switched, so these are enantiomers. The 2R3S isomer is the enantiomer of the 2S3R isomer. As you see, the S becomes R and the R becomes S, as you'd expect for a mirror image. So we have two pairs of enantiomers as possible products. Any other pair represents a pair of diastereomers. If our goal is to look at the relative stabilities, we know that these two enantiomers have the same stability as one another, as do these, but diastereomeric pairs will not have the same stability. So in order to determine the stabilities, we will draw a Newman projection for one of these two enantiomers, a Newman projection for one of these other two enantiomers, and compare those diastereomers to one another. We should start off by drawing the wedge and hash line representations from which we can construct our Newman projections. So here we have the 2R3R isomer, and here we have the 2R3S isomer. So we'll go to a new page and try to construct the Newman projections from these wedge and hash line representations. So we've set up our Newman projection scaffolds. We know that the most stable conformation of each of these molecules will most likely be a staggered conformation. And now we just need to fill in our substituents on the scaffold. Start by picking a viewing point. We're going to be viewing straight down this bond. So if we're looking down that bond, we have our 2R, 3R isomer we will draw on the left. Then to our left is a CH3 group. That's this group here. There's also a hydrogen that's not drawn, it's coming down. And pointing straight up from this vantage point is this ethyl group, which I will abbreviate as ET. On the back carbon towards our left, we have this bromine. A hydrogen that's not shown, take up the spot in this position. And then we have a CH3 that is down from that vantage point. 
So we've assembled a Newman projection. We have not figured out whether it is the most stable conformation. To assess which conformation is most stable, we will try to position the largest substituent in the back, the bromine, as far away from the other large substituents, ethyl and methyl, as possible. Now we have three choices for the bromine. It can be in this position, this position, or this position by rotating the back around. We don't want the bromine to be in between the two larger substituents on the front, the ethyl and the methyl, because that would create two Gauss interactions. The best position would be for the bromine to be in this position, where it'd be beside the CH3 and the H. The ethyl being the largest, you don't want a Gauss interaction with the ethyl group. So the correct, most stable conformation would be one in which you put the bromine here, which means you've rotated it two spaces. The H would rotate two spaces as well and end up here, and the methyl would rotate two positions and end up here. So this is your most stable conformation for the 2R, 3R isomer. Now we can go through the same process with the 2R, 3S isomer, and now again our goal would be to put this bromine, the largest substituent on the back, in the position where it is between the two smaller substituents. So we want the rowing to rotate all the way down to where the methyl group is currently. And that allows us to very easily draw our most stable conformer. Once we have the most stable conformer for each of these isomers, it's time for us to assess the relative stabilities of these by looking at the Gauss interactions present. You have a Gauss interaction here and here. So two Gauss interactions. If we look at the other diastereomer, we still have a Gauss interaction between a bromine and a methyl, just like we did over in the RR isomer. We also still have a Gauss interaction between the ethyl and the methyl, which we also had over here. But we also have a third Gauss interaction in this isomer that was not present in the RR isomer. This tells us that the RR isomer is more stable than the 2R3S isomer. So to answer our initial original question, the most favorable products will be a mixture of the 2R3R and the 2S3S isomers, and these two isomers will be produced in equal percentages. And now we encounter a multi-step problem where we are attempting to combine various areas of knowledge from earlier parts of the course with our ability to identify stereocenters and to determine the relative stability of different species. We are told that upon heating, 3-bromo-3-methylhexane undergoes the most spontaneous possible heterolysis reaction. But our first task is to provide a reasonable arrow pushing mechanism for that reaction and to provide the products. So we first need to draw 3-bromo-3-methylhexane, and then we have to provide the most spontaneous heterolysis. The most spontaneous or most thermodynamically favorable heterolysis should be the one that leads to the formation of the most stable anion and cation pair. That would be the reaction in which a bromide is removed heterolytically from the rest of the molecule. Next, we are asked whether any of the products are chiral. Now, we do have a stereogenic center in the reactant, but we're asked about the products. And the carbon that used to be a stereogenic carbon only has three bonds now. It is now a carbocation, so there are no chiral products. And then we are asked to draw a reaction coordinate diagram for the step. If we start by selecting an energy for our reactants, we have to determine whether the products will be more or less stable than those reactants. Well, we started off with a neutral compound and we got two ionic compounds. That should be much higher in energy for the products than we had for the reactants. Part two of this question asks us whether there is a spontaneous carbocation rearrangement that is possible for the carbocationic product that was formed in part one. So we begin by reproducing the structure of the carbocation from the previous page 
and then we assess the sites to which the carbocationic site, the positive charge, might end up upon carbocation rearrangement. And it might be helpful to draw in the hydrogens in those positions because it will be a hydrogen that moves upon carbocation rearrangement. Once we've done that, we see that we can rearrange this carbocation to one of these three sites. Let's draw the three possible products. So we'll draw the products of those three potential rearrangement steps and see whether any of those are spontaneous or not. So here are those three potential rearrangement products. And now we need to assess whether any of those are more stable than the starting carbocation. So the starting carbocation is tertiary. The carbocation formed through pathway A is a secondary carbocation. Pathway B is also a secondary carbocation. Pathway C leads to a primary carbocation. Each of these secondary or primary carbocations is less stable than the starting tertiary carbocation, so none of these are going to be spontaneous rearrangement pathways. This would lead us to believe that following heterolysis, this tertiary carbocation will not rearrange to a different carbocation spontaneously. Instead, it will be maintained in solution until a different type of reaction takes place. In part three of the problem, we're told what that reaction might be. And this tells us that that carbocation formed in part one will undergo coordination with the chloride anion, meaning that the electrons from the chloride would be attracted towards that positively charged carbon that only had three bonds and provide the octet for that carbon to have four bonds. So we have provided the air pushing mechanism and drawn the product, and we need to provide IUPAC names for each product. In order to name the products, we have to recognize that there is a stereogenic carbon, the carbon to which the chlorine is attached, and that means we'll have the potential for R and S isomers. So it is possible to produce R or S isomer of 3-chloro-2-methyl hexane in this reaction. The last part of the question on this page is asking us, would this step be thermodynamically favorable? Well, in this case, we've gone from ionic starting materials to a neutral product. We would expect this to be thermodynamically favorable because the products are more stable than the reactants. Next, we're asked to provide a reaction coordinate diagram for the two-step process both the heterolysis step shown in part one and the coordination step shown in part three. And it asks us to draw a separate reaction coordinate diagram for the formation of each of the products, the R and the S isomer, that we drew in part three. R axes, and we recognize that whether we are forming the R or the S isomer, we're starting with the same starting material from which we did the heterolysis. So at the top of the page, I've redrawn that reaction to remind us what that step was. Recall that we already drew a reaction coordinate diagram for this first step. That was back as part of step one, where we drew these products at a higher energy than the neutral reactant. And since we have the same carbocation intermediate, whether we are on the route towards the R or the S isomer, we have the same energy of that intermediate indicated here and here. Now the second step is the coordination. So let's consider the second step. If we take a chloride and do a coordination, we will form a neutral product. We know that those products will be more stable than the carbocation. And since we have consumed a chloride and a bromide is formed as a net result of this reaction, that's a more stable product than reactant. So we would expect this energy of the final product to be lower than of the initial starting materials. So your reaction coordinate diagrams would look something like this. In the fifth and final part of this question, we are asked on the basis of those coordinate diagrams we just drew, which of the two enantiomers be thermodynamically favored 
more and more quickly and would thus be producing the greatest yield? Well, this is almost a trick question because both of those two enantiomers have the same stability. They go through the same intermediate, same transition states. They would be formed in completely equal amounts. So we would certainly expect that we'd form an equal amount of the R and S isomers. And then as a final part of this question, it asks us what term does one apply to the type of reaction product produced from the sequence. And since it is a 50% mixture of two enantiomers, this is what is known as a racemic mixture.